welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, aka the Sci Starter Podcast. In this episode, one million acts of science. Also, an amazing video series from our talented friends at Tangled Bank Studios called Wild Hope. And some Citizen Science Month energy from the science cheerleaders. Last time and loud, everybody do science from all right, the excitement is mounting here at SciStarter HQ because we're coming up on Citizen Science Month, otherwise known as April. And this year, for the very first time, we're bringing you a very special challenge, one million acts of science. Yes, with your help, we're hoping to perform one million acts of science between April 1st and April 30th. And you may be wondering, what is an act of science? And fortunately, we have with us Darlene Cavalier, founder of SciStarter, to tell us all about it. All right, thanks for being with us, Darlene. I'm happy to be here, Bob. Thanks for having me. So, Million Acts of Science. Uh, I know we've had Citizen Science Months before, but this is a new thing. So how did this start and, and why are we doing it? You know, we were thinking, what's an easier way to describe collective impact, why people should get involved, and who doesn't want to be part of a challenge that seems so audacious, but we know is going to be doable. I mean, we looked at past trends of engagement levels in Citizen Science Month, which is April, and we thought, Let, let's do it. Let's give people an opportunity to pick the way that they want to um, kind of interpret their act of science, whether that's through adding data to a project, analyzing data, finishing a training, attending a Citizen Science event, and um, give them opportunities to report it, although we have other ways to calculate and add all this up, and then really celebrate people. What we really wanna see are the people doing the act. So and we wanna hear what they're doing. So you'll see a whole social media campaign that really celebrates the acts and the people behind them. So every time somebody uses the hashtag of one million acts of science, spelling out one, those get pulled onto the Citizen Science Month, especially on Instagram, on the Citizen Science Month web page. And you'll be able to just kind of see yourself up there for a little bit with prizes as incentives. And you'll be able to read all about this on the citizensciencemonth.org website, which is also 1 million acts of science.org. Great, okay. And what is one act of science? How do, how do we define that? For us, what we define as an act is you're either directly involved in a citizen science project. So that might be where you make and share an observation, whatever the protocol is, whatever the instructions are for that project, you're doing that. You're absolutely submitting and sharing the data because as we know, that's what makes things participatory science. You're actually participating in a way that generates data and information that others can use too. So that that is at its core what an act is. So that act may be adding an observation or that act may be analyzing data. Many scientists, as we know, have so much data and they need help going through that data. It's not just scientists, it's other people who run projects in the community, people who are curious and concerned and need help from many other people to add data, fill data gaps or analyze data if there's too much data. In addition to that though, we are hoping to see people attending events. That is an act, although it's a little different than what we would normally classify as citizen science, but the events that are that we can see on Citizen Science Month during April, in April, um, these are they typically are training events. So you're learning. That's that's a big ask, that's a commitment, and we're happy to reward that and count that as an act. Um, also, many of the events are organizing people to come together to do projects together. So obviously that's an act too. Okay, and I know um, uh, there's a calendar, plus there are thousands of projects on SciStarter, plus there are projects that aren't on SciStarter. So which sorts of things count as an act? Like, do they have to be SciStarter projects or should they be? Um, the, for convenience, looking on SciStarter for a project in particular, looking for something called an affiliate, there's a way to search for projects by affiliate, or you'll see an affiliate logo. Those are great ones to get involved in, in part because there's no reporting needed on your end. Uh, those affiliates actually use tools that report back to SciStarter that you did something. So each time you add data, each time you analyze data, if you've given permission, which most people do, 
that, that's already tracked. So those apps are already accounted for you. So, and another reason to do affiliate projects is because they're like the gold star standards of projects. We vet them very carefully and so forth. So lots of reasons to do those. And as a reminder, most projects you can do from anywhere at any time. Um, and then there are other projects that are on SciStarter. Obviously they're vetted as well. We encourage you to do those. Those require one more step for you to report. Actually fill out a form that says, I did X, Y, and Z. Uh -huh. And then the other way is, of course, if you find something that's not on SciStarter, you might already be involved in activities or you might um, just find it elsewhere. Absolutely do it. I mean, it's not about only things that are on SciStarter. So good question. Thanks, Bob. Okay. And now, so um, the uh, what happens if we're at day 28 of the month and we only have 423,000 or conversely, we're at day four and we hit a million <laughs> um if we are at you know day 20 if we're at day 30 and we only are halfway there we will, you might come back to the sign and the website and might have a little gone fishing sign <laughs> <laughs> we're all gonna quietly go on vacation um, it's not going to happen that scenario won't happen because uh -huh. um, there's there's projects that are out there between earth day and between City Nature Challenge at the end of the month, between some of the Zooniverse projects happening throughout the month, this is going to reach and exceed 1 million. Mm -hmm. That second question I hadn't thought about yet. What if by you know the second week, we're already over 1 million? The site has a fun animation. You, you, you'll see it soon. Is as we're building up and, you know, and adding mm -hmm. acts to, I think we have a test tube or something that shows it. When it overflows, it bubbles, and it, it bubbles with stars and celebration, and those stars are actually acts. So you'll be able to look at the different yeah. acts. That, I think it's great. I mean, that's an amazing problem if we have, and then you'll know next year why it's called 10 Million Acts of Science. Great. All right. Thanks, Darlene. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Emma Giles is SciStarter's Manager of Public Outreach and Programs and has been hard at work coordinating activities for Citizen Science Month and the One Million Acts of Science Challenge. Hey Emma, thanks for taking time out from your crazy busy schedule. Absolutely, Holly, Bob. Happy to be here. All right, so let's talk about some things that people can do in case they're already planning their uh, Citizen Science Month calendar. What you got? Well, I can say to better your calendar even more, we will have a public calendar coming out to help you Ooh. decide on what to do. Um, and we will have something for every day of every week of every part of April. So I am a big fan of uh, Dolphin Day is on the 14th of April. Dolphin Day? That sounds, don't you have to be in um, Florida or on a coast to do that? You can be. So some projects are going to be ones that you have to actually see dolphins for, for sure. Uh, but it doesn't actually necessarily have to be the case. So there are other projects out there that are just online, um, similar to like the way that uh, we have a project for manatees, but you don't have to be near a manatee. It's it's manatee chats. You're listening to like audio of a manatee. So examples okay. like that, where it, it takes you online to see things that you wouldn't normally see in your everyday life, depending on where you are. So an opportunity to kind of put yourself into a different area, a different thing that you don't normally see, uh, which is nice. Okay, so we have a mix. There's a mix of online, offline, in your backyard, in a park, all that stuff. Definitely, yeah. An example of one that's like in your backyard, um, at the end of the month of April, there is the, uh, this one's an easy one, a go-to is the City Nature Challenge, because uh, that's a global event through iNaturalist and a couple of other organizations where they're documenting biodiversity for the last weekend of April, and this happens every year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going outside wherever you are, making it very local to where you are, um, and taking part in uh, observing wildlife um, wherever you are in the world. Okay. So it can be very local. It can also just be a take a step elsewhere. All right. Any any other favorites that you have that we should alert people to um, for uh, ways they can participate in One Million Acts of Science? Definitely. Um, because I'm working with the calendar right now, I'm looking at the Awareness Weeks for uh, Wildlife Week, which is just so so great for so many projects. And so one of my favorites is Instant Wild. So wherever you are in the world, you can still look at uh, animals photobombing camera traps and try to identify them for scientists. And so Wildlife Week is gonna be full of those ones. National Public Health Week. We've got a lot going on, so it's hard to pick favorites, but I know I'm excited for uh, Wildlife Week. Um, Project Sidewalk will have a highlight as well. So I'm just excited mostly because of all the projects that are gonna be involved. Um, I mean, even things about frogs and 
uh, Monkey Health uh, Explorer, which I did a SciStar Live on recently. I'm excited for that one too. So we'll be boosting all these at you. So I'm excited for everyone to see um, uh, what opportunities there are if they haven't seen these ones. So it'll be fun. Great. All right. Anything else that we should uh, let people know um, uh, or anything else you want to share? Um, we do have a sticker. If you use Instagram, you can use our little stickers. I don't know if anyone has mentioned it yet, but... Oh, a virtual sticker. Yeah, a virtual sticker. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a... Oh, we also have real stickers too. If you go to any of our events that we're hosting and some libraries will also be passing them out, there will be a sticker you can write out. It says, my act, and then you write what your act of science is, and then oh. uh, and then it says, I have one million acts of science, and woo. Um, <laughs> big celebration but we have virtual stickers too so if you go on instagram you can actually do it now anytime um and you search sci starter on the giphy app um you'll actually have an option of i think there are four stickers my favorite is the uh, test tube that gradually fills up um and so you can use that during the month of april and before then i've been um like spamming my my close group of friends on on instagram whatever they're called in my story so that they see mm -hmm. me using these stickers like hey check out my sticker <laughs> Everybody needs to yes. spam their friends. Spam their close friends list on Instagram. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much. Sounds fun. Thank you. Now, let's say you're interested in citizen science, but you're reluctant to just jump in on your own. Well, you may be able to find resources and advice right at your local library. There's something called the Citizen and Community Science Library Network, which is run by SciStarter and Arizona State University, and that's in collaboration with the National Girls Collaborative Project. Tara Cox is director, and she says there are a bunch of activities developed especially for Citizen Science Month, including some for the total solar eclipse on April 8th, and others that can be done throughout April and beyond. We've actually developed some really great resources for libraries um, over the last couple of months, um, one of which are these recipe cards for different events that libraries can host during the eclipse. If you go to citizensciencemonth.org um, and the resources link there, you can look at the different recipe cards. Uh, and they are just sort of quick and easy guides for how to host an event like a BioBlitz or a, a pollinator event. Those are really popular with libraries. Um, libraries can also tune into our activities and our events during Citizen Science Month, and that counts as an act of science. So we're doing an, a, a webinar in April all about ce celebrating citizen science in libraries. And we have a ton of other events. If you go to SciStarter.org, forward slash events, you can look at all of the different events happening um, and libraries can stream any of those that are virtual. And so that's another way libraries are getting involved. And if you're a library and you're just hearing about this for the first time, or if you're a person who wants to let their local library know how they can get involved, um, how, do, how do they do that? How do libraries like sign up? Yeah, so if you go to SciStarter.org forward slash library, you can see all the different options for libraries. Signing up for the network is always the best place to start. We have a monthly newsletter with resources, funding opportunities, um, community connections. We have a Facebook group where libraries share what they're doing. So that's a great way to get started to sign up for the library network. Also, in May, we're hosting a two-part online institute for libraries both here and in Europe and across the globe where we are going to be, you know, testing out a new training for libraries to become community hubs for citizen science. Wow, I didn't know this was international. That's, that's yes. really cool. Yes, we used to be called the National Citizen and Community Science Network, but we dropped national uh, because there are so many libraries involved. And if you look at that map that I was talking about earlier, you'll see libraries obviously in the U.S., but also in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, South America. Wow. Libraries everywhere are becoming community hubs for citizen science. Wow, that is great. Well, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So we're here to support in any way. Um, if you email library network at scistarter.org, that's our specific inbox that we are uh, that we manage for library support. So we are willing to hop on a call, talk through activities, share our resources. Check out the YouTube page as well. Um, that has links to all past webinars. And yeah, if you have any questions, if libraries out there have any questions, they can certainly reach out directly and we're here to help. Great. All right. Thanks, Tara. Thank you so much.
Well, last month, I shared some citizen science projects from our partnership with NASA. And today, I'd like to share the work of another SciStarter partner, Wild Hope. It's a video series produced by Tangled Bank Studios, which is operated by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI. And um, Tangled Bank just sets the standard in documentary film productions. They're just amazing. They had a film, um, All That Breathes, that was an Academy Award nominee. Uh, Inventing Tomorrow on the Peabody Award and My Garden of a Thousand Bees is just, I mean, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. And uh, the link is here. And Wild Hope just follows that string of excellence. It highlights regular people doing extraordinary things to protect the environment. Tangled Bank's senior producer, Alex Duckles, was the special guest on SciStarter Live to tell us more about the project. Our approach as storytellers is to make sure we're focusing on the individual, eff the individual efforts, the change makers, the people, the alliances, the volunteers, the teachers that are leading to this change and that are inspiring hope. What makes a wild hope story a wild hope story is not that it's about biodiversity loss. It's about the recovery. It's about reversing that trend. It is about a hopeful solution. And there are thousands of these stories. We have a list of 500 of them that we would want to tell. And we're just creating this universe, creating this wild hope um, community and this movement in order to get these stories out there. So our goals, like I've been listing here, are to change this narrative from one of despair to one of optimism and hope and action, to spotlight the people and organizations and to lift them up. Um, they're doing such amazing work and we're just happy to be able to tell their stories. And then, of course, to educate young people and to inspire further action. If we do our job well as storytellers and video producers and inspire that moment of hope, we realized from early on in this project, we better have something for, pe for people to do, to get their hands dirty or to participate in citizen science or to know where they can then volunteer and activate. Um, and we've seen it. We've been able to tell these stories that convince audiences or awaken audiences that anyone can be an agent of change. So let's make the content available for them to do so. And that's one of the reasons that we've had such a strong partnership with SciStarter. You can watch the entire episode of SciStarter Live on our YouTube page, and you can watch Wild Hope for free at wildhope.tv. Well, if all this isn't enough to get you excited for Citizen Science Month in April, perhaps the science cheerleaders can put you in the mood. They are former professional and college cheerleaders who now have careers in science and medicine and engineering, and they helped us spread the word about citizen science at the Awesome Con Festival in Washington, D.C. Last time in Laos, everybody do science rumble. Everybody do science rumble. Everybody. So this is part of Citizen Science Month in April, which is uh, by SciStarter. In case you don't know, SciStarter is our sister organization that lets anybody anywhere be involved in citizen science to help professional scientists fill in the gaps in experiments that they can't do alone. So we're going to cheer for citizen science and we're going to do our one million cheer. One, two, three, one million! Thank you guys so much. Yep, we're pulling out all the stops for Citizen Science Month this year. Okay, that wraps it up for this episode. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands of Citizen Science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's, say it with me, S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot -E org. SciStarter's founder is Darlene Cavalier. You just met her. And thanks so much to you, the listener and citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us, any things you want to hear on this podcast, you just want to say hi, get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>